Hold. I'm going to send this to to uh, Marguerite then after we're done. So, so um, Peter, um, please start. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Applebaum, and I'm a professor of education at Arcadia University, which is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the United States. I'm the director of education studies programs and art education programs at Arcadia. Education studies um, meshes with my um, primary interests these days, which has to do with education as a discipline that's not specific or even necessarily has there to have anything to do with schools, but really thinks more about community development and uh, institutions of education other than schools and their interaction, perhaps with schools like family and media and other things like that. Um, my, my primary concerns lately um, have to do with the fact that education does not seem to prepare people in any way for uh, anticipating, addressing, or responding to global crises. Uh, before the pandemic, I had convinced my university to provide seed money to create an international conference on that very issue. Uh, but of course, there was a global pandemic crisis, which uh, brought that to a complete halt. And now the university thinks that there's no way such a meeting could ever take place because of the problems of global crises. I find that um, in, in, an amusing, ironic way to describe things. Perhaps that's enough and more than you wanted as an introduction. Okay. Um. I'm Ming Fang He. I'm professor of uh, curriculum study at the Georgia Southern University in Georgia, United States. Um, I was born in China, grown up in China, was educated in China through to university. And then I received all the graduate education in Canada. Um, so I'm Chinese Canadian. Um, my research areas are in uh, several area. The first area is how the I study about how the Eastern philosophy and the Western philosophy meets in curriculum studies. Um, I did an article about compare, comparison, uh, compare the work of uh, Zhang Dewey and uh, and also Confucius, Confucius, and also the um, the Japanese philosopher. Makiguki, and which is very much related to the human education, actually. Um, my second area of research is about Asian Americans, particularly Asian Chinese uh, in the United States. And recently, I developed this area into Asian diaspora uh, studies, and which is my current area. And the, the other area I'm studying is my international work in Hong Kong and China particularly Hong Kong and China, and about the minority and the marginalized group in Hong Kong and China. The other uh, area of my study is about activist practitioner inquiry, is my work about with my students, doctoral students here in Georgia, um, particularly the curriculum narrative of a curriculum in the South. So I'll stop right there. Bill. Oh, I, I couldn't remember where I was in the list. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Schubert. Uh, from, uh, it, uh, my career was at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the United States. Uh, and uh, in 2011, I uh, retired, became a professor emeritus. So I've been a, um, a retired uh, scholar, still working, still trying to uh, to accomplish things. Sometimes things that I couldn't accomplish even when I was with a with an institution. So I think that that is uh, um, that's significant in some ways. Uh, and uh, my area is curriculum uh, theory, curriculum history, curriculum development, and so on. Uh, and broader spheres of, of education in and out of school. And I focused maybe a little bit more in my retirement in out of school 
uh, dimensions of uh, learning and shaping one's ideas and the communities one, one is in and so on. I've been very much interested in looking around the world at uh, the kinds of neglected curricula that uh, are implicit, sometimes explicit in indigenous groups and in, um, in uh, the global south and in uh, Eastern uh, uh, thought and so on. Um, Ming Fang and I just finished editing the international or er, the encyclo uh, Oxford Encyclopedia of Curriculum Studies, uh, which just came out. And uh, before that, we did a sage book on uh, the uh, on education uh, e e curriculum in education. Uh, and uh, and I'm trying to do a continuation now um, of uh, um, what uh, of the kind of thinking I did in a in a book called Love, Justice, and Education: John Dewey and the Utopians, 2009 book, which they want me to revise. I don't want to revise it, but I don't mind extending it. Uh, and so, and I see that as a different kind of uh, project. So anyway, those are some of my concerns, and they they certainly fit with uh, um, the tenor of this uh, this uh, human education in the third millennium. Okay, so I think it's my turn now. Um, my name is Bonnie Wozlick, and I'm an assistant professor of education at Penn State University Abington College. So that's a Commonwealth uh, campus that's located just outside of Philadelphia. My work considers questions of social justice and qualitative research methods and teaching practices that focus on the examination of race, sexual orientations, and gender identities and expressions. Um, prior to being uh, at the within the academy, I was a K-12 teacher for uh, over a decade, um, teaching world languages. Um, practically speaking, the way my work tends to uh, come out, I have a book that just came out this last year where I worked with queer and questioning middle school youth and women who are were survivors of intimate partner violence in India. Um, and then another edited volume that is slated to come out soon here on Black Lives Matter in US schools. And that's me. <laughs> is it me? <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Nicholas Singofuck. I'm a professor of uh, curriculum theory at the University of Ottawa, uh, which is the capital of, of Canada. And I'm a first generation settler colonial immigrant to Canada. Our family now resides on the unceded ancestral territories of the Algonquin people. And much of my work now at the University of Ottawa seeks to understand how settler colonialism in terms of the intergenerational impacts it's had through its institutions, such as public schooling or forms of Commonwealth democracy have for its different citizens, as settler Canadian citizens, but more importantly for First Nation, Métis and Inuit communities that continue to um, call for uh, recognition uh, in non-tokenistic ways of in terms of their territories and land and treaties signed uh, between uh, old stock Canadians and um, and the and the different forms of government that those First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities have in place. So, uh, trying to address the way in which the school curriculum works as a discursive regime to help Canadian citizens forget uh, where they come from, who they are, in relation to certain kinds of settler colonial financial literacies, um, and then the work in terms of truth and reconciliation for remembering and restoring different kinds of stories moving forward as we think about our past, present and future relations with First Nation, Métis and Inuit communities. Mike. Uh, yes, uh, I am Michael Baugh. Uh, I, I teach at the University of Oklahoma uh, I'm an assistant professor here um, in Ed Leadership and Policy Studies. Uh, I split my time between Ed Leadership Policy Studies and uh, a department called Gateway, which is really sort of an undergrad diversity course. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, an affiliate for, so I do those two things, but then I'm also an affiliate for Film and Media Studies. And um, 
I am, and then this summer I will be teaching a course that is uh, for connected to the Osher Institute um, and uh, focusing on, uh, cause my focus uh, recently has become on adult education, adult learning. I teach for the higher ed program, adult learner, uh, um, adult, adult education program uh, here um, under ELPS. Uh, so my focus recently is coming, you know, become you know connecting with uh, uh, community partners that are uh, providing adult education to community members and and those that provide adult education outside of vocation uh, without certification uh, to uh, uh, on campus as well uh, so that's been my most recent uh, focus is adult education um, and uh, my research interest really is uh, um, mainly afro pessimism and anti-blackness um, uh, throughout uh, its liter you know, it's throughout education and throughout the world. Um, so, hope I've uh, answered everything. And formally, uh, I remember the uh, uh, I think Paul mentioned this, but uh, formally I used to do the uh, work at uh, Auburn and Montgomery, and I was in the Honors College. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll talk later. Walter. I'm Walter Gershon, and I speak to you from Philadelphia on the unceded lands of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the Lop, <coughs> the, I can't speak today, I've lost all my voice, of the Lenape Hakiunk peoples. Uh, I work across the river at Rowan University in Southern New Jersey, where I am Associate Professor of Critical Foundations of Education, and also uh, coordinate our Urban Education uh, Master's Program. Uh, the scholarship I have tends to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look at questions of justice about how young people make sense and the sociocultural processes that inform their everyday sense making and the qualitative methods used to study those processes. So curriculum studies, educational and critical sociocultural foundations and qualitative methods. Um, the work I do often looks at questions of the senses through the sonic, but I look at those as sort of tools to better interrupt how we often conceptualize education in ocular ways and to try and get at other ways to have people express themselves and their understandings so that we might have a more liberatory set of education and how that might function in practice. Thank you. Jim. Sure, um, hi, my name is Jim Jupp, I'm professor and chair of the Department of Teaching and Learning at. University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. This is in the borderlands between North Mexico and in Southern Texas, right? Um, on the ancestral lands of the Lipan Apache and uh, Guahuiltecan nations. Um, we, I, I, my, my interests have spanned a few things, but most recently I'm, I'm um, interested in in uh, decolonial and place-based education for, and especially regarding future teachers in our region, um, leveraging their bilingual skills, leveraging their, their um, indigenous pasts and uh, leveraging those into critical teaching in classrooms. Um, it's nice to be with everybody. Hey everyone, my name is Paul Eaton. I'm an associate professor of higher education leadership at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas, which is just north of Houston, Texas. Uh, my research uh, also spans a lot of areas. I'm very interested in uh, critical humanities issues in higher education. Uh, critical digital pedagogies and the impacts of technological systems on college student learning and experiences, um, as well as what I would say are broad questions around post qualitative and post humanist inquiry and what that means in higher ed. Um, most recently, the projects that I'm really involved in are looking at uh, specifically how the work of James Baldwin gets integrated into teaching and learning practices for equity and justice work in higher education. Um, and I'm also very interested in 
uh, what I would call reading, reading practices of scholars in the field and how we think about and conceptualize reading and literacy uh, within higher education structures and systems and what that does for learning and teaching. So that's a new direction that my research is taking. Uh, and I'm happy to be here with all of you. All right, thank you all. Um, so um, I wanna start with the preamble, of course, and, and I wanna ask you broadly, um, looking over this document, do you think that the preamble sets the stage for what we're trying to do and give you as an outside reader a context as to what we're trying to accomplish right there? Anyone can chime in at first and then um, use your, your virtual hand and I'll, rec I'll acknowledge you. Well, <clears throat> can I, what do I do? I have to raise my hand or you're some, good. some technological hand too or something or what? No, you're uh, good. Okay, uh, I I uh, I like the uh, the general uh, idea of of this and the purpose. Uh, it seems seems good. I wonder about some of the specifics. It seems like it maybe needs to have a little bit more in it um, about. Uh, you know, when you say a transformed set of educational institutions, curricula, and methodologies, um, I don't really get a sense for what that means. It could be in many different directions. I guess the the emphasis is just to read on. Huh? I mean, that would be the intention. Um, uh, and uh, then... So, so I mean, that's the only um, thing that I have, except for uh, not all continents, not Antarctica. Okay. All right, Nick, go ahead, please. I thought if you could provide maybe a little bit more concrete context for the preamble for readers. So whether it's um, uh, because of climate change, like mass migration or conflict and mass, but but kind of naming and maybe having hyperlinks to some of the, whether it's UNESCO or the UN uh, as examples that would help help people understand. Um, and, but also give concrete examples of what you're, you're speaking to in relation to doing that. Um, I understand like the difficulty of tension might be then acknowledging some of those organizations and the, and the preamble and the kind of the political connections or conflicts that might arise in doing so. All right, thank you. And that reminds me, I wanted to say quickly, um, when I raise these questions, um, you're, um, I'm not your audience. The audience is um, the, the group, and then they'll listen to this, and, and they'll listen to what you say, and then and talk about it. So um, we'll just keep that in mind. But, um, so if I don't respond, it doesn't mean that, that I don't have a response. But the audience is, are people that are not here. I, I just uh, I wanted to just add something along the lines of uh, what Nicholas is saying too, I think, and that is um, how um, to get to know who the group is a little bit more because it's some, it, it strikes me as some, just a vague um, group of people and I don't know anything about who they are unless say I go to the, uh, to the website and so on. So, uh, I mean, if this is a standalone document um, that would introduce people to the, uh, the project, well then uh, I think it could have more of that kind of background in it. How, how did it emerge or, or I mean, well, very briefly, of course. So you're talking about like an institutional history? A little something like that. I mean, I know in a, in a uh, preamble you can't do, um, everything, but uh, uh, tell a little bit more about where this is coming from. Yeah, so, but in, on the website, on the website it, that, that, that history could be stated, so. Yeah. We could maybe hot link that. Like you could, we could just do it with links so that it's embedded yeah. in, as Nicholas was saying. That's a good idea. 
the the thing there's language throughout and i understand the um the desire for the language but some of it's like creating miseducated cultures and as a person who has participated in cultures that have been called miseducated since i was young these are the kinds of things i think we have to be very clear about um, because what we're trying to do i think is to have some kind of um, more open yet clearly defined liberatory set of pathways for education and possibilities for it. Um, and the, sky, the sort of uh, dis discussions about what's education, what's miseducation, what's possible, what isn't, are almost always defined by those who have the power to do so. Um, and even though we're doing looking at this from a lot of different perspectives, um, I, I, I do think that, uh, that such things would be significant to keep an eye on as we go on. And also my apologies to Michael and to Ming Fong. I did not see your hands. Thank you. Hey, and me too. I'm first. Yeah, Peter. Also Peter, who gets to be first. The hand went up first. Anyway, um, so maybe I'm saying something similar, but like, like focusing directly on the preamble. The word concerns, I, I might have used something more like observations because concerns seems negative and I, I feel like when I raise my concerns, people shut down and have no interest in what follows because they just think I'll be a curmudgeon who's complaining. So I wondered about, about repl just replacing the word concerns with observations, but then of course, like they're all negative. They are all concerns. So I wondered about like in the preamble, there could be some more positive observations, you know, like because the whole thing, the whole document is somewhat negative and complaining about, you know, how education is a complete failure. And when I speak in those words, no one wants to listen to me again, you know, um, they want to, you to say solutions, you know, and there are plenty of people around the world doing all sorts of transnational educative projects that are promising. So this may be harder to put in a preamble, but some kind of pointing to some um, transformative actions and, and networks might be good to put in that preamble. Ming Fong? I agree with everybody, what everybody said. Um, I think in the beginning, people needed to know the context. I think is a, this is a, like international. So you needed to make the context really contested, com complicated in a lot of way, but there is a common, uh, there is a common uh, place uh, among all those complexity and the contradictories. And I think it has to be like right away that in front of a pro, like this whole document shouldn't should be portrayal the landscape of the education in the world, the landscape of world education or something, um, because that in that way you can have a very good effect. Up. Another thing is I think that in the context. I would like to see, because you have a group of diverse scholars from different continent, and what kind of theoretical tradition they come from, philosophical tradition, you know, um, that would be very interesting to see, uh, let the reader know what kind of foundation you build upon, like uh, the East philosopher whose work you build upon Gandhi and somebody else. Um, and I see a lot of languages from Gandhi and other people, Eastern philosopher I'm very familiar with. Um, so that's something. And another thing is there is one word in the preamble in page one, uh, I think is number seven, the seventh concern. And the second line, they produce, cons consume and the privilege of learning over education. I think that learning here has to be changed to schooling because the learning is much more complex, complicated and it's much more evolving while schooling is a problematic. And so I think the learning there is not really capture what you want to say there. So the learning has to be changed like schooling. That makes sense to me. 
Um, another thing is, I don't know whether your group, I saw Bandera Shiva was there. Is she, was she there? One of the Indian scholar, woman scholar, she looked like a Bandera Shiva to me. Uh, no, she wasn't there at the, um, the initial gathering in Dharamsala. So. Mm, okay, because her work is actually very relevant to what you talk about here, particularly about eco ecological crisis and also human connection with nature and the ecological system. I think her work is great. She criticized the monoculture of mind of the globe actually, um, which is also very relevant. I see a lot of similarity actually. I don't know your group are familiar with this. Um, this is a, like a peace provoke Peace proposal. Um, there is a Japanese philosopher. Her, his name is um, Daika Yakida. I can I can probably uh, give you some copy if uh, Bill has the same one. We can give you one. And he writes this peace proposal every year, and to UNESCO, I think. And it's a great document. Like he talk about human human education, but he used the human revolution. He talked about human revolution, the peaceful education. So he draw upon the Eastern philosophy and also Western philosophy. So it's quite interesting, his work, because a lot of work you mentioned here, actually, like um, you talk about value, but you don't say value creation because that's his work. Um, uh, about the associated living, that's John Dewey's idea and also Confucius idea, Buddhist idea, uh, Taoist idea, everything is associated living. Um, joy of learning, happiness of uh, uh, living, all those. Um, that's a draw upon both Eastern Western philosophy. So that's uh, my first reaction. But I think the concerns are quite, com quite comprehensive. Uh, I, I cannot think about any other concern not mentioned. It's quite broad and quite comprehensive. We just need some context before you talk about concerns. Okay. I agree with Nicholas. Um, yeah, I hear, uh, uh, I, I, I also agree with everybody. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think if I'm correct, uh, Peter's comment about the positives, if I'm correct, um, but then we wonder, can we, is that too much right now in the preamble? Um, um, but I, I think, I think we can, we can fit it, this in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a few sentences here. Um, when, when it's discussed in the uh, preamble, like we need to confront certain aspects of current education policies and identify several vital positions for education people in the world. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, uh, can can we add some specificity there? So are we trying to address the um, um, we're trying to address certain aspects? We're trying to address aspects of education which do violence to I'm just making statement right now, which do violence to or uh, do harm to uh, blah 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 bodies uh, in and this and this corporeality whatever, and then work to <laughs> transform uh education into blah, blah blah and then and that's some of the positives and we can we can work on that later. Does that make sense? Um, uh, so, so that can be accomplished in that, that third little paragraph there, uh, I think incorporating some of, some of Peter's comments, um, uh, as well. So I hope that made some sense. Mike, to be, to be clear, I, hate, I hate when sentences are wasted where it's like, Hey, we're going to do certain things and, and then go about doing them certainly. And I'm like, what does that mean? It's always, don't waste sentences. Tell me exactly what you mean. Um, but go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to be clear that you're talking about the third paragraph from the top of the preamble. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, Walter. The only thing I, the only thing I wanted to add to that is that there's um, a couple references to truth and truths being, uh, being absolute. And that also makes me nervous. Um, just because I don't think there's any one thing. And I think part of what this document's trying to do is simultaneously uh, show the universality 
of certain kinds of human experiences for a common set of what might be possible, how we might be helping one another and also make room for the space that we all might do it in ways that we find ethically uh, uh, viable for our particular context, content and groups, right? And so, um, and that tension is throughout the document. And so here, I just think it's seen, it's seen in a bunch of places, but like, what is a true education and our true selves? Um, I, I can, I get that uh, from a, a Buddhist perspective, um, but if you were to say that from a Northern, Northern European perspective, that would be colonialism. And so I think that these are the things that we need to attend to as we look through these pieces. Um, and, and again, it, I think it's sentiment versus word, um, but given that when the, we leave these things, the document is what survives beyond our conversations. Um, these are things we might keep an eye on. Peter and Michael, is your, your hand up again or did you not? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure. put it down. P Peter, then Bonnie. Uh, uh, just a quick comment that I, I think I might tend to disagree with Ming Fang on the replacement of learning with schooling. Mm. I, I understand that for a lot of places in the world, schooling is a very powerful um, institution of education that might be the target for uh, what needs to be addressed. But I, I also feel from my own work, and that is in collaboration with a lot of people on pretty much every continent in the world, uh, that um, schooling is so out, outdated and is mostly an institution of all the problems of social reproduction and global inequity. Um, while other institutions of education might be able to take key roles in a transformative educational movement. You know, family, religious institutions, community activism, uh, transnational networks, um, you know, huh. popular culture, and so arts and, and so on. Sure. I got a tinge of negativity from you, Peter. I'm not sure if you, <laughs> you were giving up. I'm <laughs> yeah, I, I just feel like school is not the focus if you want to save the world right now or the planet. School is the problem mostly, you know. So make sure you add your positives and your negatives, Peter. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Point <laughs> about replace learning with schooling. So everyone will keep looking at schools, whereas the institutions of education, like social media and other forms of popular culture and mm. other uh, community uh, ways in which people learn and families and neighborhood networks and so on and political movements. Oh, well, really, Peter, you're talking about, uh, essentially, you could just sum it up in three terms, Peter, uh, informal, non-formal, and formal education. Some of these things that people want to reduce to informal are very formalized and structured though. So, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm I, just saying that I, I, I mean, I don't like do a global replacement of learning with schooling because many of the places might be better off sticking with learning or some other word like um, community building or something. Hmm. I thought there, there is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That they are criticizing. Uh, learning there. That's why I didn't like that word there, because the the sentence they they produce. Mm, good point. Okay, good point. Learning over education. If you're saying that the learning is not appropriate, it, when you explain, you, di you explain differently. But from my reading, is they criticize learning, and actually learning could be very uh, broader term. And learning is a much better term than schooling because schooling is a t institutionalized. It's very um, much uh, um, uh, colonialized in a lot of ways. Um, people use a school to imprison people's mind. And that's what my point is. And if you read, the, read the, that sentence, it just uh, does not like, if they criticize schooling, uh, I don't get it there. I know what you talk about, though. 
Uh -huh. um, so, I'll get bogged down in this. I yeah, well, well, Nick, do you have a different point or you want to add to this? And Bonnie and Walter, do you have different points or you want I to? Just, I just wanted to add to the preamble. I, I don't know if you've been able and the group's been able to take a look at UNESCO's 2021 mm -hmm. um, document on reimagining our futures yeah. together, a new social contract yeah. for education. And there's the way in which it's framed at the start. I'd be interested to see the group putting together this document in relation to what's been put forth in that document. What are the similarities or differences in terms of how how it's being articulated? For sure, my sense is there'll be differences, and I wonder what what those <clears throat> might be. So I, I was just curious about that in terms of the group going back and thinking about that 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 doc that kind of policy document that's come out if you will, um, from UNESCO in relation to um, this declaration and this document, if there was synergies there or conversations taking place or it's completely separate. Mm -hmm. what? I was Nick, going I, to- I, I can, I, Well, Bill, uh, Nick, I can tell you that yes, um, there's been a UNESCO document that we've been circulating. Randall Curran, who's a philosopher at, at, at Rochester, he was circulating the document. I don't know if it's the specific one that you were talking about, but there's definitely one from UNESCO that was recently put out that that he's been, he gave to us. So yeah, there are several ahead. several documents. Um, the one Nicholas talked about. That's one. There is another document called the Living Together, Learning to Living Together, Live Together. That's also very meaningful and relevant to what you talk about there later on when you make a proposal. I, I was going to bring up the, the uh, UNESCO uh, Futures, uh, Imagining Educational Futures Project too. Um, and, uh, and so I will second that uh, idea about co possible collaborations and so on. Uh, I was looking into that through some of the work of um, um, Fernando Reimers from uh, Harvard. Uh, who's done a lot of investigating that and so forth and publishing on it recently. And, um, and uh, also I noticed that uh, in some of their uh, materials, uh, I saw um, uh, uh, Santos, um, uh, Sosa Santos's work and, and kind of involvement in it and Jim would know quite a, Jim Jeff would know quite a bit about that uh, um, through Jal uh, Periskeva's work and so on. So uh, yeah, I, one other thing that I was kind of concerned about and I thought ought to be problematized a little bit more is the place of the state. I mean, there's some places down here on like around 6.6, 6, 7 and 8 in, um, in talking about the concerns uh, about the state, the role of the state. The state is better than say some things, but how does the state connect with nationalism and, and the problems of nationalism and so on. So, um, and uh, another place in the document, they, um, it's the state is, seen as, uh, or nationalism is seen as problematic, but uh, here uh, it seems like uh, the state is assumed to represent the public. And uh, to me, it seems like that uh, is, is a problem as well, because uh, is what the state calls public schools, and it's not used the same everywhere in the world, of course, that, term public schools, but does that represent the public or is that what we want to do to the public in order to shape them into our economic, political and value system? Not ours, but I mean the dominant powers. Um, uh, Walter, go ahead and then, then I want to raise a second question. Yeah, and did, was someone else had a hand up before me, I thought maybe? No? I did a while ago, oh, but yeah. most of the, the ground that I um, wanted to cover has been covered, so fine. I just wanted to briefly make a comment about schooling. As we look through the rest of the document, I think this is gonna be something we should probably bear in mind. 
which is as problematic as schooling is. And, and everyone here who knows me knows I've been pretty much on the record about this uh, for quite some time. Um, if we get rid of what are public schools or schools that are free, we're basically going to say in a lot of spaces, including in the United States, that we're removing the access to education for people who are poor to working class and for girls. And that tends to be the first two groups who get uh, moved out of education when it becomes privatized um, or when it moves out of the public domain. So it's for me, there's a little bit of a tension there while I think there are deep problems with schooling and there are deep problems with the indoctrina indoctrinization involved. If we remove it, we hurt those people who are most often um, who are most disenfranchised regardless of how that works in any space. And so that's a part of the tension that I think we should keep in mind as we move forward and think about these ideas, um, which is not to disregard or say that any comments people have made about schooling so far are somehow incorrect. I completely uh, I hold uh, with all those positions. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so um, let me ask you this second question. Um, did you find the document overall satisfactorily inclusive enough for your liking? And when I say that, I don't just mean um, in terms of human inclusivity. What about non-human entities? Um, so um, I'll stop there because when Walter spoke the first time, I said immediately when he was talking about truth and universality, it's immediately what I thought of. Um, and that was my initial response at at the gathering in 2019 as well. So anyone want to start? Um, I know I saw Paul shaking his head. So anyone want to start, please do. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll say I don't think it's inclusive enough. I know that it's a document that's centering the human, but it seems to me, and I gave this in a comment to you, John, that, you know, many of these problems that we're dealing with if we're talking about ecological crisis, for example, are rooted in humans thinking that they're the center of the world and not enough of the relational thinking that needs to be going on in terms of decentering ourselves and trying to say, how can we be part of you know, larger systems, you know, relationships with animals and the cosmos and plants and things of this nature? Um, so part of that is, is ecological education in nature. Part of it is trying to think in terms of relationships and away from the economic drivers that undergird so many of the critiques that the document is making. I don't, but, but so much of what the document is talking about seems to me to reproduce the types of educational questions that we've been grappling with for much of the 20th and early 21st century. So all the stuff about identity and personality and you know this sort of stuff, those are still important questions, but do they fundamentally shift the, the dialogue that we're having in education? I don't know that they do for me. That makes sense to me. Fine, go ahead. So, I mean, I would agree completely with that. Um, as I was reading it, part of what I, I kept thinking is that there's a lot about humans, human bodies in relationship to other bodies, but it's, it's in relationship to as a secondary characteristic rather than thinking about um, bodies plural uh, as they exist together, right? So um, I think for me, it, even in, in the way that it's framed when other bodies aside from human bodies are included, um, it's nature in this nebulous understanding or earth in this nebulous understanding. Um, and so I think that if it was going to be more inclusive uh, of that, then maybe those systems need to be troubled as they're currently written and or perhaps some exploration, albeit brief perhaps in this space as to exploring what it what they might mean by human bodies and non-human bodies um whatever that means right I, I just i don't i don't think i did not necessarily read it as centering or even thinking predominantly um with non-human bodies 
it just it's not how it reads to me it's just written from a humanist perspective and there's nothing wrong with that but um i just didn't feel it in any other way in my first reading and can i follow up uh with a little more specificity john um if we think of for example go under the section that says human being and the aims of education which i think is under it's subheader one under Roman numeral one. The first point there is, there is no education without a concept of the human being, implicit or explicit. And I wrote in my comments back to you, I think this is a statement that should be challenged because the universe learns and shares information all the time, and it doesn't really need humans to do this. I still stand by the belief that in order to truly change the world, humans need to decenter themselves from the dominant position to one that is in relationship to everything else. And so this is an example, I think, of what Bonnie is talking about. When you write these broad statements like this, and you say that we can't think of learning or education outside of human consciousness or whatever we're talking about, I just don't agree with that. I, I think that you know the universe is a learning system and it doesn't need humans in order to do that. It was learning long before we got here and it'll be learning long the hell after we are gone. So, you know, we need to really challenge that in our thinking if we're going to create different types of approaches to trying to solve problems or to deal with all of these things that we continue to have to deal with from nationalism to economic exploitation to authoritarianism, nationalism, war, all of these things are rooted in human centeredness and lack of relationality. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I'm oh, sorry, did I cut you off, Paul? Um, I couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more, Paul. I always, you know, uh, tell uh, uh, some of my students that are ready for the, the stars speak a language you can't understand. Um, and um, the sunburst, that's a language, you know, um, explosion, that's a language. Um, the universe is commu cosmos communicate in, in manners that you don't pick up and because you can't decipher it, you say that they're not speaking. Um, and so, uh, 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 and I always wonder, you know, you ever look at an animal for long enough and it's you and the animal in, in the field and, you, and it's looking at you and you wonder, you start to ask yourself, am I an idiot? <laughs> Do I not get something? Um, and uh, uh, so uh, rooted in, in, in Bill Schubert's ideas, <laughs> that right there. Um, but uh, um, uh, I always, uh, I, I, I was thrown uh, in the document a little bit for you know, two reasons. Um, he said humans are, uh, if I remember correct, humans are basically, let's say, just causing this problem, ecological problem, all these things. Um, for me, I just, uh, I mean, who is human being really? And, and the some that are not human beings. And so uh, there are blacks that is a, the argument could be made that have no relationality compared to everyone else. Um, but human beings are causing the problem. I, I, maybe I'm, I'm so wrong, there are a lot of people, let's just say, I'll just say there are groups of people before European colonization that had a very good relationship with the land and its resources. <laughs> Um, and had a very different understanding of you know being stewards, and and I had um, um, one of my um, my uh, uh, one of the professors here from from Wichita um, uh, tribe come in and talk about we are you know we are of this land and this idea of ownership and this idea of being a steward very very different from the dominant um, uh, European perspective of owning owning crap so uh uh but uh but there are people uh before colonization there are people on on what i call you know many people call it the continent i call it the continent that have a very different relationship and understanding um uh, uh of, of of land and resources and and responsibility um so who are we talking to and who are we talking about um uh, I would definitely not not blame the uh, Iroquois for this, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so, uh, and I could be off base. Tell me if I if, if I am. But uh, uh, those are the things that struck me. And 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 every time we talk about building community and stuff like that, how do we get others into? How do we invite those who are not there? How do we give them invitation into? citizenship invitation uh, into a, a human and global citizenship, how do we give an invitation into humanity? Because that invitation currently is not there. Um, 
So I don't know how you would go about addressing that through that document at this point. I have to think about it a little bit more. I have to let it cook. Um, but I hope some of that made sense, Paul. I don't know if that made, <laughs> but I, 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 do, I do echo, uh, uh, you know, like I said, um, um, this other, this learning, this huge learning system, that uh, learning machine, I don't want to go into Papert, but this whole, whole uh, machine that, that, uh, that runs it, that um, it's a different form of education. All right. Oh. Walter, go ahead. My mute didn't unmute and the cat has moved. So speaking of human, non-human, more than human, there you have it. Uh, but I, I did wanna talk about the tension in human and humanities throughout the document, because um, to the points made so far, if human meant everyone, we wouldn't need children's rights. We wouldn't need rights for people of color. We wouldn't need indigenous rights, correct? Um, and I know we're, we're all shared in that part. Um, and conversely, um, one of the concerns I have is if we, de if we flatten all the relations and we decenter the human, that's also how oppression operates freely. So part of the tension that I think we should be thinking about and just sort of sharing with our colleagues to push back at the sort of questions again, is the notion that people should be treated well by others so that they walk away respect and dignity and resources and all the important things that we need that are very human being focused. Um, and at the same time, that requires paying attention to ecologies, right? So maybe if we think about these things as educational ecologies rather than spaces like that, maybe linguistically we can get out of these things a little bit. Um, but I also think that part of what we can do is to highlight the tensions in the document and let those tensions be, right? Like some of the really helpful form, uh, formative documents I've seen, including the UNESCO document, have tensions in it between, that, that allows the tensions to both be there. Um, and I think that that's sort of an ethical responsibility also, is to think about how we can help um, alleviate disenfranchisement and injustice and at the same time um, recognize that there is something that humans do to one another and to the environment that we're paying attention to. And education happens not just from the person but from the environment. And at the same time, we'd like to make sure that uh, more than human animals have access to education that is liberatory. Jim? I was gonna say like, I'm not sure my comments will be helpful, um, but the document doesn't speak to any of my interests. And I, I mean, I, I'm almost beside myself with skepticism about it. Um, I, but I do, I do wonder, um, going back to the initial set of questions, because I do get the idea that that the, the politics is like a place of strategical insertion, right? Without that idea, I have no interest in the document whatsoever. But if we understand it as a place of strategical insertion, then I can tolerate it in that way. And so I'm, I'm just wondering like, what's the, can, maybe I didn't study enough before this, but what's the organization? Um, that it's representing and Pardon? what's the project overall that is the carrying all of these humanisms in it. Yeah. Um, so that's... Let, me, let me address that, Jim, and then I want to turn the, okay. give you a question then. Um, okay. The group is, and there's a website if you want to go to it some other, sometime soon, um, it's called Human Education in the Third Millennium. When I was invited into group, that that title of human education got my attention because I never really saw discussions of education with the word human in them. And because I interpreted it as a, oh, now maybe we're recognizing that there's other forms of education that are not human. That's why I originally thought that the word human was in that title. Um, and so um, it was initially um, sponsored and created by a group of Russian thinkers who are Buddhist and that, and then they had connections to, um, um, the Dalai Lama in India. Um, and, and, and now it's rep there's representatives from all of the continents other than Antarctica, but the other six continents. Um, and we're trying to get together a declaration of what we should be paying attention to in the third millennium. 
Um, now, let me turn it on to you a little bit here. You said this document doesn't represent your concerns. Give me one example of what your concerns are and how might this document begin to address it? Could you do that? Well, I, I just, I mean, I, I guess I've, I've been really interested in thinking from specific locations and, and then the, and so I, I can't imagine anything coming out of the words national or international that's helpful. Um, and so I found that to be running through everything. Um, and so it, it just, just the skepticism so large, but, you know, I, I might be going in a utopian vein, but it just sounds like the language of capital, e e even though you're saying it's Buddhist, right? Like, I'm not feeling that in the document, but I, I, there's things that I, there's things that I might not see and, but I think you're helping me with the context. So I appreciate that. So I don't mean to be, you know, all, um, critical. No, no, this is, this is the purpose of our gathering here. Okay. All right. And, and I'm glad you said it doesn't feel like a Buddhist document because that, that's the, that was the original form because that was the original group, but it's grown now. And you can see all these other influences because those influences have made an impact on what this document is looking like. So. Dr. Dr. Jeff, I love, I love that line of thinking. You know, I love that. You know, you know me by now. <laughs> you know, I love the skepticism. I was kind of missing the old Michael. Like where's the, <laughs> where's the blow porch, right? Like. <laughs> Um, he's gotten so old now, or maybe he's tired. Um, um, but uh, but or the uh, younger Michael, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hated by most people. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, when I first read the document, and I was gonna, when I first read the document, I was like, oh, this is for white people, <laughs> um, um, and 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 those on the on one side of the color spectrum, <laughs> um, uh. And um, I only got excited when I saw the section of adult education and I see that um, um, it seems like the adult education section is kind of going in the direction of, of, of Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Knowles's uh, uh, androgy, I can't, I can't speak, can't say it today. Um, uh, Andrew androgyny. Goji. Androgyny. Androgyny, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and and so and so it's it's that that last section of the very end is kind of trying to go in that direction. It seems like Knowles' six assumptions, but not fully. Um, um, uh, and and I, I had some edits about making this, you know, focusing on transformative education, um, and 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 maybe <laughs> something along the lines of trying to avoid red hat red hat societies uh, from spreading, even though it's already prevalent, um, um, but the modern Red Hat Society, I'll call it. Um, uh, but uh, I just felt like it was, it was, uh, it didn't speak to, um, uh, uh, we didn't, it didn't speak to a certain ontological situation um, um, that, that many like me may find themselves in. Um, and I, uh, and I would, I would like that. And I would like, you know, an adult education that uh, um, when I taught a, a recent lesson on adult education, well, like, I think two classes ago. Um, and I said, we always turn to, you know, we always turn to these white men about, you know, this and that, but for, for, for Elaine Locke and other people, adult education uh, must be relevant. And I don't, it must be relevant to the population. I don't see something like this being relevant for a bunch of um, slaves people who still exist as slaves. Um, and so uh, uh, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, uh, and I hope uh, a little bit of that made some sense. A, a lot of this discussion uh, makes me, um, especially what Paul brought, brought up about the, um, the, the cosmos kind of learning within itself and, and growing makes me think of what we normally call the inanimate 
as perhaps something that not only humans but all of the animate ha uh, in the in the world has um, has been a, a kind of a, a malignant mutation of. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering all the way back to say Dewey's uh, um, common faith, uh, where he really is, in a, some sense, asking the question, uh, is it a warranted assertion to, uh, to claim that uh, faith in, in humans and in animate being is, um, is warranted? Uh, or is it largely destructive? And, um, um, you know, where do we go from there? But still, I think to, to, to address the question of the, uh, the, you know, the cosmos may take too much time. That's the problem, the same kind of problem that was faced by uh, the so-called reconstruction constructionists like uh, uh, Counts and Rugg and so forth when they said, no, we've, <laughs> we, we can't wait for democracy to work things out. We've just got to say that peace is better than war or something, you know, and, <laughs> and go with that. But um, I'm, I'm rambling, of course, but it's probably, that might be the best I can do. Uh, but I think there is something that needs to be pursued. And I've been working on this, trying to work on this, but you know, about the, um, the inter intro learning within the inanimate, what we would call the inanimate of the, of, of the universe. So, um, Ming Fong and then Nick, but before you go, um, can, can everyone um, stay after 4.30 because we're already approaching 4.15. And I'm assuming that the link's not going to kick us out because I set it for an hour and a half. So, um, so go ahead, Ming Fong. Um, I I agree. Um, the docu document is a very much focused on anthro anthropocentric rather than anthropocosmic. Um, so even for the Eastern philosophy, for example, even Confucianism. They talk about learning to be human. They didn't say learning to be a human being. They learning to be hum human for Confucius is to engage oneself in a ceaseless, unending process of creative self-transformation, both as a communal act and as dialogue response to heaven, which is, means nature and other cosmos. And they also emphasize um, the hu human beings are in the midst of a nature while nature embeds human flourishing with a series of a con concentric circles, self, family, community, society, nation, world, and the cosmos. They emphasize a lot about the cosmos. The human being, uh, how can I say, for Confucianism, Buddhism too, is that the human existence actually, there is no human existence without talking about the connection, the evolving connection and the development between the humans and the non-humans and the other beings. So they always talk about that, even Confucius talk about that. So that's not clear. Another thing in the document, um, I'm having a little bit of problem about that is, uh, I don't know which page now, is talk about what is democracy. And that itself is very, very problematic because in my writing, I talk about, um, let me go into it, is like in different culture, different ethnicity, they use different word to talk about um, democracy. And a lot of people don't even use the democracy at all. For example, um, a lot of people talk about like for the first nation people in Canada, they talk about educating the heart, mind, body, and the spirit. And also they might, some culture and the ethnic group, they might use revolution, social activism. Some group might use freedom, liberation, 
and some group might use critical consciousness and the uh, constellation, like Paul Ferry talk about. Some group oh. might talk about love, justice, education. Um, some group might talk about diaspora, exile, um, and a lot of different notions. So when you try to define what is democracy, democracy, the word is so polluted in North America and it does not capture so-called the word, like a global kind of consciousness about what the democracy really mean, because in different culture, linguistic context, um, the word means differently. Another aspect of, as a language person, because that's my background, original background, does not mention anything about linguistic diversity at all, and which is also, I think is very important. And the North American, a lot of people, not you guys, a lot of people are very monolingual. And the monolingual represent the mononess, monoculturalness of a people's mind. Um, that aspect is not mentioned at all, which is a kind of a, you know, problematic. If you look at a UNAXO's document, I forgot to what the title of it, talk about cultural linguistic diversity. That's an early, early document. They really emphasize the diversity uh, include a lot. You know, it's a linguistic diversity and, uh, and also cultural diversity and also uh, all way of living you know, include the non-human beings. So that's what I feel. And also I have a major question is what's your audience? Like who is going to read this document? Who is going to learn something from this document? What's the audience of this document? Who is the audience of this document? Um, real quickly, um, the audience would be policymakers hmm. in no particular order, educators, students, parents, um, and scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Nick. I get, I just, uh, like when I'm reading through the different sections of the document, I get a sense that there's a, a tension and a kind of a discursive tension in terms of, of trying to do something radically different, but using the same language that's been used for the last 200 years to take up the proposed changes. So it's almost like, you know, you could go read Alfred Whitehead's The Aims of Education and lift some of the things that are there and you'd see they'd be almost exactly the same in terms of how they're proposed in um, this document. And I, I wonder, like, I understand, like, in terms of, like, defining education, you say education of a third millennium implies following transformations based on human-oriented pr principles, but why not, like, um, you know, because later you talk about, like, ethics, why not, eth why not principles based on eth ethical relationality or um, in the sense of, sustainable livelihoods, uh, um, living in a good way. And coming back to what Mi Fang said was, you know, I, I, there's also seems to be lost, like once some of the ideas are translated into English, it, all, it, it gets caught up in kind of a, an, a, a Western uh, epistemological, ontological framing that loses kind of like that sense. And that, I'm just a hunch that's there in terms of how some of the concepts are taken up. And I mean, that's the, that's the difficulty, I think, in terms of, for me, working with Algonquin elders who have, you know, who speak Anishinaabe Moan, which is the oldest living relationship with place, that the concepts that they put forth, you know, best, best approximation in terms of translating in English, but it doesn't really do justice to the way of being or way of relating to place that they're, that's contained within their, 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 the language. So I just, yeah, so that, that just for me in terms of reading, when you, when you asked the original question, like how could the document more be more inclusive, maybe in the, in the preamble kind of being forthright in terms of some of the limitations of what working within the English language does and, and the context of, um, high, you know, a high, you know, if your audience is higher education to begin with and we're talking, we're using that language, that right up front, there's going to be some limitations that you're, that, 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 even despite trying to be radically different in terms of what you're all proposing, uh, it might come across as something that we've seen a hundred years ago proposed by people who self-identified themselves as European settlers, for example, to North America, 
who were also labeled as progressive educators. Walter? I, I was going to make the same point because what gets embedded in all of this or in a lot of this then becomes the sort of eugenics language that is part of the parcel of how we do education in English and how these things get embedded in what we do. Um, and I was also, so that's to Nicholas's point and to sort of add to that about what gets embedded in the language and how it gets moved forward and how those things function. Um, and also in terms of how language limits or enables, you know, amplifies or dampens certain understandings and ideas. Um, but I was also thinking about George Noblet's moves uh, and how he talks about qualitative research or did uh, and still does when he does it, whatever that might be. Um, uh, which is he starts with a set of ethical commitments. And there's something about starting in that fashion that I think might be helpful for the preamble or for the document in general, because uh, you know recognizing not only the, the shortcomings that we have, but this is what we're committed to. And if those things were up front, um, then we could have a different kind of document. It's sort of like when you go to do research with a group of people and you don't share with them what you're gonna do with them, they can't possibly decide whether or not they agree with it and or whether or not they wish to continue participating with you. Um, so I was just sort of thinking about, about those sets of ideas as Nicholas was talking as, as an additional set of possibilities um, that might provide a place to voice those understandings, um, which in no way um, is, in the, uh, is meant to detract from any of the points just made. I just mean this as a, a possible pathway um, that may or may not work even, uh, given the, the constraints and the, and the, and the concerns. Paul? Um, again, I think for, I think specificity is always helpful. <clears throat> so let me point out um, under bullet point or under Roman numeral two, where you define education, uh, point number one, the first sub bullet. Oh, wait, maybe that's not the one that I want to say. Hold on. Uh, the third sub, the third sub bullet. I'm sorry. You're saying educators should educate for the entire earth and for global human society, which requires an ethic of shared collective responsibility, assimilating wisdom from the world's diverse traditions that are harmonious with nature. I think this gets to everything that people have been saying. And the comment I would make here is that we need to be careful with languages like assimilating. This, this idea of assimilating wisdom from the world's traditions might be important, but how can we do that without taking up the logics of colonization? And that might just be a conflict that the document may not be able to resolve, but it's just something that you all should be thinking about because what often ends up happening is that people from the West end up assimilating, to use that word, or colonizing this kind of language, not reading it, not understanding the place boundedness of where it comes from or how it could be applied in different contextual environments. And then the language and the approach to living, the philosophy, whatever you wanna say, ends up becoming abstracted and not helpful. You know, I see this a lot, for example, with Paulo Freire. Everybody quotes Paulo Freire, but doesn't actually understand what Paulo Freire is saying and doesn't actually enact what Paulo Freire is actually trying to say, right? They just throw him in there to be able to say like, look at me, I've read, or I, I know this name. So I, I think that these are dangerous things that happen in education because we, we try to take up other knowledge systems, but we don't do a good job of actually thinking through the ramifications of what that means. So let, let me ask you a third question. And it goes, um, Paul's point is a segue here. And it goes to that section um, um, defining education, and I call that the pedagogical section. Um, but so, um, looking at this this document pedagogically, um, th does it um, leave out any pedagogical approaches that you think should be there, um, and that that we should include? I 
I wouldn't say that it leaves this out entirely, but uh, to me, the document does not do enough to complicate all of the stuff that's going on with technological learning and online learning. There's some very broad language in there about people should produce their own algorithms, which I think is a very dangerous statement. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't to me take up how human technology interactions are changing the face of what we think of as education, even though broadly throughout the document, there are references to things like misinformation, disinformation, people, you know, not understanding those types of things. But that to me seems to be a huge problem uh, that is not adequately addressed in the document. Mm -hmm. well, are, you, are you talking connectivism? I don't, I'm just asking, I don't know. Um, it's not necessarily connectivism. It, it's, it's more what I would call, you know, critical digital pedagogies of how you both, how you analyze the way that technologies are shaping what it is that you learn in particular types of ways from a power analysis perspective, but also how we can leverage technologies to advance educational aims in particular types of ways that are not harmful. So it's always a both and, but a lot of, you know, a lot of these um, kind of global problems that we're seeing with disinformation and misinformation, <clears throat> social media problems, all of this kind of stuff to me is rooted in a lack of understanding about the human decision-making processes that get put into place in building those systems that then sort of catapult out of control because we don't want, because we get caught in this kind of weird loop of saying like, we can't do certain types of things because it's, for example, taking away people's freedom of speech when it's like, well, is it, you know, like Elon Musk buying Twitter is not a freedom of speech issue. It's, it's an issue about, you know, regulating things to an extent so that people are not being misinformed. So I don't know. I mean, I could spend all day talking about that sort of surveillance capitalism stuff, but it just doesn't seem to me like it's in there in the way that it needs to be. Another thing from my perspective, some people might disagree with me, I think is missing in defining education. Um, I think is that people always uh, make education very ahistorical. I think people need to learn about the history, learn the lesson from history. For example, this is your Korean wall and the Russian, I can see a lot of history about that kind of war, but a lot of people here don't. They don't see the history. They don't see what's the real cause of it. And instead, they only look at the surface. I think people don't learn about the history. So historiography is very important for people. Another thing is, is missing there is um, almost like a place-based education is like a critical geography. Um, geography, there is a Japanese philosopher has a book, a very good book. Maki Guki has a book say, Geography of a Human Life. And which is really try to talk about uh, every learning should happen, in, uh, establish the relationship of coexistence between human beings, the other beings and the nature. Uh, everything should be connected. Um, so that's not there. Another thing, another thing is not there. Um, people might disagree with me because I always look into that. Is I think the education, one of the education, um, the responsibility as an educator, we need to find a way to create a hope. We already experience enough depression and suppression in the world. And so how you create hope out of no hope. Uh, I think how you demand the impossible become possible. 
um, make the impossible become possible. I think that's very important when you define the education. Otherwise, it's not so meaningful for me because I remember um, like in cultural evolution, it's almost like in five minutes, so somebody will die in front of you in the street. So in that kind of situation, think about the people living in the war zone and they, they have no hope. Um, every day they experience some death in front of them. They cannot even articulate the loss. And I think the hope, educating hope, I'm not saying pathetic hope, this is radical hope, educating the radical hope should be part of defining education. Bonnie, go ahead. Yeah, um, and I, you know, I want to just say that not only do I agree with what my colleagues have said here, um, I'm, I had a little bit of mixed emotions as I read point 25 um, under the educational activity dimension as well. Um, and this question of um, the type of pedagogy that's, it said something about, maybe it's not there, uh, developing the, the ability for struggle. It kind of goes back to some things that Michael was saying before. Um, I, I kind of feel like there are lots of minoritized communities that are already uh, well steeped in understanding struggles. <laughs> And so part of me, what part of the concern that I had as I, I read those sorts of sections um, was that it, it just sort of raises the, the ways that white supremacists, for example, could actually use this kind of a document to say, well, we're exposing students to conflict. Um, and without any specificity, I think that that can become dangerous over time. Um, so there, there were a couple of times, and I know that that's just but one example, but a couple of times in that document that I, I read it, and particularly coming from a US context um, in the, the things that we're dealing with right now, I just kept reading and thinking like, okay, well, this is a, <laughs> this is a moment that other folks could use this actually uh, to, to just reinforce types of oppressions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I'm a little worried about the language in that way. I told you, Bonnie. <laughs> This is a document for white folks. <laughs> right. Well, I, I knew that be well before I was told. Um, you know, and right, like I'm not saying that you, that you would say you, that. I'm, 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 I'm messing. With you. I'm not saying. No, no, saying. no, no. You're right, though. Right. Um, but just not just white folks, but minoritized folks altogether, and that becomes a concern. Um, and I don't know. Again, I don't know if this is just because I'm coming from a U.S. context um, where we're watching consistently um, language being used against us. Uh, and so I just, I would just say caution, right? Um, and I'm also seeing that the, the document is not really set up to think about uh, questions of disability. There's a couple of mentions here and there, but that's largely missing as well. Um, just the protection of minoritized folks altogether. So those are, there's just a lot of- Yeah, was age in there as well, um, age related? I don't think so. Not that I can That's recall. A huge part of, of adult education, of course. Yeah. Are we talking about young adults, working age adults, mature adults, and stuff like that? Um, and I know the OSHA's focus on the mature, um, but uh, that was something that was missing. That I that was in my own personal commentary um, as well. But uh, great job. Yeah. No. And even just looking at um, down at the the bottom portion when they're talking about early childhood education, for example, and some of the the wondering parts. Um, that are included in there are skipped in um, secondary and higher education. Um, and I, I sort of, that again, have caution, right? So at what point do we encourage people to stop um, wondering and finding joy and, and things like that? Um, but even there in the language, uh, children's natural ability to smile, something like that was one of the, um, one of the things that was written and from a feminist perspective, right? I have questions about that too. And in the ways that that, that kind of language can be used inherently against um, people who identify as women and, and things like that. So I don't know, I just, I had a lot of caution as I was reading through this, whether it's warranted or not. All right, thank you. Um, Nick? Yeah, I was, I was wondering, like, you know, you had that one point about algorithms and teaching, but to what end? Like, so it's just kind of there. And I, I wondered, you know, rather coming back to what Paul, Paul was saying, thinking about communication ecosystems and the different 
ecosystems that we're part of, like we're social media ecosystems and the different mediated systems that one is a part of and what kind of pedagogies do you need in, in relation to each of that as a uh, public, as you engage the public from wherever you are. And uh, Mifang said like, look, if you think about like, for example, um, what, what happened in Syria and now the Ukraine, um, you know, there's youth that have expressed themselves using these different um, ecosystems to reach out to the world in terms of what they want to teach. So thinking about that as a form of pedagogy as well and, and the sustainability of such um, pedagogy. So yeah, again, I, it's that section, I, I kind of, when I'm reading it, I still see pedagogy framed in a kind of um, very kind of, you know, the way in which we've been educated in higher ed, it's higher ed institutions here. Uh, through that. So it's, I, uh, yeah, and I don't know what the answer is to that, because that's something that I struggle in my own work to kind of try to rearticulate um, with, uh, you know, the different communities that I'm fortunate to work with. So, yeah, but I, I, I do have the similar concerns to everyone for that section there. All right, uh, real quick, then, then Walter, um, you know, there's been a lot of themes of how this document sounds like a Western document document and a, a document from the United States or the Western Hemisphere. What's, and I think that's accurate. Um, but what's funny about that is when we had this initial conference where we talked about what, what do we want to put in a, a document like this, there were four of us from the Western Hemisphere and that's it, out of the whole group. So, so go ahead, Walter. You, you passed? No, 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 I just moved my mute button to a place I couldn't get it to try and get everyone in the chat up at the same time. I uh, outzoomed myself. Um, so the yes to everything everyone has said. And, and again, like part of what happens as all of us know when we do work outside of North America is that language and what higher education is and what education is has become a, a certain kind of standard that even, regardless of one's place in the world, the, the way that that's colonized ideas is a problem. Um, and so I just wanted to, to make a note of some assumptions about the goodness of things, um, which I think has to speak to what we're doing here. Like uh, all the talk of curriculum is a formal curriculum with one passing of hidden curriculum. There's assumptions about pedagogies being tools for goodness and health. Uh, when we know that, um, you know, in the United States right now, if you're teaching really well, you're probably hurting kids uh, because you're giving them that standard, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, assumptions about democracy being a tool for good and positive, um, right? So there are those kind of questions we have. Um, and uh, a side note in, in relation uh, to the side of those things, um, there are two or three places where spiritualities are put in. And I understand that that's put in um, to try and make space for non-Western ways of being, knowing, and doing, and thought, and in life. Um, I do get nervous when spiritualities end up in education. Um, I've received multiple kinds of spiritual educations over my life, so it, please understand this is not my point uh, at all. Um, but it is to say that when they're involved, what ends up happening is that um, they become a substitute for a kind of ethical sets of maneuvers that then don't get to be spoken about because it's the dominant set of understandings. So whether it's India right now or the United States right now, for example, um, these, are, these are problematic. And so I would, I would urge some caution um, when we talk about these things. Uh, and when we're talking about sp spiritualities to uh, one of Nick's points earlier, we're almost never talking about in indigenous ways of being, knowing, and doing, and sets of, uh, of, of uh, interrelations that may yet be more helpful and healthy for us. Um, so I just wanted to sort of note those kind of things as we're moving through, that the things that are assumed to be good should be questioned about whether they're good. And the question about whether religion is also a force of good should probably be something we keep an eye on. Yeah, Walter, you brought up religion. I, I actually um, brought up the point that maybe we should talk about religions um, in this document and um, we didn't. So let's, let me just put it that way. Um, because, and then I, I appreciate, you know, we were in India, a long history of religious tension, and that, and that came out. 
you know, I say, really, you want you, you want us to get into in trouble? Is one of the responses that that I got, and and I understood that. Um, um, but it, it's it's a, a major factor throughout the world, and you know, for me, uh, if if I look at religion, I look at it theologically than anything, and anthropologically, and I have no interest really in spirituality or or, or religion from any other perspective. Um, but I understood where they were coming from, um, the tensions that that the word religion itself brings um, to a discussion worldwide. Let, let me ask here, so we're, we're dwindling, so let me ask you this. Um, Bonnie, you mentioned it, and um, uh, Mike mentioned it about adult education. That, that section is the last question that I have, and that is the four levels of education, primary, secondary, tertiary, and an adult education are mentioned. Um, what's missing um, from that, if anything? Bonnie, you mentioned uh, one, th one thing. If you want to reiterate that or reiterate that, that would be great just for the context of the people that are going to be listening after I send this off. And then I do eventually want to get back to Nick's point and um, who else was it I talked about? Or Paul, you talked about it, about algorithms. Um, I want to talk about that because I think that is a major issue um, that is that is going nowhere. Um, and going to be major, um, it's already major, it's going to be more impactful as we move forward in, in time. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm even just wondering, so my, my point before was, you know, wondering about even the, the levels, quote unquote, of education that are stated here, um, and the purpose for the divisions. So there are some things that I think are ideas that that we should be thinking about across ages and age groups, right? Um, to the points that were raised earlier about questions of non-human bodies, um, that sort of gets lost from my perspective after the, the primary level of education. Um, and that's something that I think that adult education <laughs> all the way through should be thinking about um, are those sorts of relationships. So I, I wonder sometimes, um, and there are a couple of things, right? So my my colleagues in early childhood education do this lovely job about thinking uh, about how we tend to discount um, some things that young people are able to do when when it comes to thinking. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that we we think too little of of little I don't know um, small tiny humans <laughs> and what they have the ability to do and, and the ability to think about. Uh, and so I wonder if we were to even collapse these without categories, what that might do. Um, you know, I, I don't know, but I just, I, I, I get concerned that A, with the thinking of non-human bodies, how that gets lost after the primary level as it's, as it's stated here, um, but B, the idea that young people couldn't think about themselves as they're, um, as it's related to understandings about broader living and things like that. Um, I know anyway, my four-year-old is consistently thinking about those things, <laughs> although it might not be theorized, quote unquote, the way that you might think about in adult, in adult education. And so I just, I wonder what the benefit of having these individual levels is, if any, um, would it help to sort of mess with the understanding of, of primary ed education that doesn't, um, it doesn't always mean the same thing in every country too. So I wonder about that as well. Um, I don't know, I just, I had a lot of questions about how things were broken out here, right? And then even for questions of, of ability um, that you might have an, uh, an older student that's still participating in what's primary education here in the United States. Um, and so I, I wonder and worry about how those things also get lost uh, in the, the current structure that's proposed. Thank you, Paul. Um... I'm going to frame this by saying I need to now spend time thinking about this because of something Walter said earlier, which is what happens when we don't have, if we talk about getting rid of public, or if we talk about getting rid of schooling, for example, then, you know, like who gets, and, you know, I tend to agree with, with Bonnie on this thing at the end about splitting the levels out, and, and it, it gets to a larger concern that I have, which is, you know, there's this commercialization of education and it shows up in the document. And when you split things out like this, the way that it's split out, the assumption that's being made 
is that people will still will have to continue through formalized systems of education in order to survive uh, in the world, largely from economic factors. I'll give you a recent example. I was at a provost's town hall meeting on my campus about two weeks ago, and our provost was discussing the um, upcoming what's called the uh, enrollment cliff where we're going to face around 2025 this kind of you know in the US this sort of like national dropout of college age students uh, traditional age students and how the university is preparing to handle that and one of the things that the university is proposing doing is taking up trying to advance what they're calling adult education through micro credentialing and badging and they want to basically reach out to people who have graduated from the university and try to retool them right this is the language retool reeducate for the new economy for the you know and all this kind of bullshit which is rooted in logics of the university surviving as a fiscal entity not really caring about people's humanity and so all of this kind of short termedness that gets locked into all of these ways of thinking about education has me very concerned because the university doesn't actually care about educating these people. The university cares about bringing these people in so that they can get their money. And, you know, the, the micro credentialing and the badging just is, you know, a kind of outcome. It's the same thing with certificate programs and all this shit. And so, I just have real problems with that approach to thinking about the future of higher education. And I think it gets locked up when we start to split things out, which is why I share Bonnie's concern. But I'm gonna to have to think more about it because of what Walter said earlier. Just to interject briefly though, I don't see them as um, uh, at odds with each other. In fact, I think that a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of like the, when we move to algorithms and the things I just put in the chat about commercialization and mm -hmm. reductive, like the assumption that skills, measurable skills should be a good building block, which is not mentioned anywhere in this, but is clearly uh, implied. Um, those are deeply problematic. And so the question is, in how should we radically change school? It's a question of whether or not we should eradicate schooling. That's sort of the, the piece I'm speaking to. Um, and so for me, the ethical move is to keep schooling because of what it does, uh, what public schooling can do for education for people who would not have other, otherwise have access. But that in no way uh, excuses the kind of crap stuff that's going on. I just, I just want to be clear. Because a lot of times what happens is we get to de-schooling and everyone's like, just get rid of schools. And then it's like, okay, but who gets educated then? right? Like public schools in the United States. Uh, if you have a wealthy school, a lot of schools give like, um, like 250 to 300 bucks a kid. I know schools where they give $5,000 a student to the school. And it's in a unified school district, like LAUSD, there's schools where elementary schools where the kids get 5,000 bucks a kid. It's just sort of expected from parents in a place. It's, it's kind of amazing. So these disparities exist under the rubric and under the umbrella of public education as well. I mean, you didn't interrupt that. Right. And I think, you know, like, I, I understand what you're saying, Walter. And the reason I say I need to think about it more is because like the same thing is happening in the higher education sector, where you have this kind of forceful push in societal discourse that, you know, because higher education costs so much, it's just not really necessary for you to go and get a higher education. So just skip that or, you know, winnow down the curriculum and winnow down the process of getting the higher education to as few credit hours and as few experiences as possible so that you get a badge or a micro credential so you can go out and be a participating member of an economic system that's set up and designed to exploit you. And, and what gets missed in all of that discussion is that, you know, if we would just finance public higher education, if we would just make decisions about what it is that we want to do as a society to give people time, space, and money to be able to spend the quality time that they need to spend to get quote unquote educated, 
we wouldn't be having these problems that we're having with financing and, you know, like cost and all of this other kind of stuff. And to your point, the people who end up getting the message that they shouldn't go to college are the people who've always been told that they can't go to college, right? And, and so there's also a, a justice and equity issue that's embedded in all of that. That's, it's very troubling and very problematic that we're not having more critical con conversations about all of that stuff just in the higher education realm. Well, uh, let me add to that, Paul, and uh, Walter will know this and Bonnie will know this. Um, after 1970 in Ohio, the governor, Rhodes, right? Wasn't that Rhodes? Made a pledge, and so did the, the legislator, made a pledge that students in Ohio will never pay more than 40% of the actual cost of their education. That's been blown out of the water for over three decades now for Ohio students. And when I was at, at the University of Akron, I had students that would come to me. I was teaching a, a senior level class and they had to take the class and they said, I got to drop, it conflicts with my work. Um, and they're working so they could pay for education, but they couldn't finish their education because they were working. Um, and it became a vicious cycle. And this, is, this became a problem, an immense problem to the point as you know, Paul, about student loan debt, because we shifted from the 70s to the present from where it was a responsibility of the state to help people get an education to now it's a personal investment, including you're responsible for getting the loans to get the job done. Um, and right. that's and, this night nightmare. Right, and, you know, and in addition to that, we've got other sorts of problematic things that are going on. Like for example, I was talking yesterday to my colleague, Dr. Meredith Billings. She's a, a finance professor, finance of higher education. And we were talking about uh, New Mexico. Uh, and, you know, right now there's all of the, you know, you can open up the higher ed websites and they're like, you know, New Mexico has made all of their college and universities free, right? That's the headline. And so there's this kind of like discourse out there that, oh, this is now free for anyone in, in New Mexico to be able to go to any school in the state, uh, absolutely free. Well, when we talk about it, that it, it's A, it's misleading and not actually true. And B, it's a one year thing, right? It's like they made it free for one year, which does really nothing if you're talking about the total cost of getting a higher education. Sure, it alleviates pressure for some people for a short period of time, but it doesn't do anything to eradicate the systemic inequalities that are baked into the system. The same thing with them pushing back on a national level, you know, they keep pushing back the student loan for, you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, I just, I can't get into it because it's just so frustrating the way that we're talking about all of that, but I think it's all connected. Yeah, and it is. And, um, you know, check out sometime if you haven't, Paul, how much tuition cost in, in Texas university system in the 80s. It was hundreds of dollars for a year. That's it. Um, California was the same way. Now we're talking tens of thousands of dollars with just reduction of financial aid other than loan, which is a dead end, which is, you know, it, it's a loan shark scheme is what it is. So, so let me, um, anyone else have any other comment about these points? Because we're getting close to five o'clock about the, the, the four just levels. Just uh, quickly, John, one, one thing that I noticed missing from the document and may, and might not be the point of it is that there's no section on, you know, future research or research capacity to contribute to what's being put forth. So I think that that needs to be in place maybe for those putting together the document. It's like, okay, where's what, what, what commitments to research or is going to take place as part of this and, and committee and, and uh, committees or whatever. So um, maybe they can partner with some universities to create some micro accreditation programs that would train students to do research on this initiative. They could all get badges after once they're certified to be part of the social network. Of the... <laughs> I got a right ball. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay, so I think that's a good point, Nick, to, to put on there to talk about for further furthering research on these various topics. Um, and and research, 
I mean, to make the point that research involves uh, theory as well, you know, mm -hmm. developing theory, and because some people think of research as a very separate thing from theory, and so I think it should be, I think it should be said. And not here, you know, though. Not here. Yeah, no, not here. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to, but in a document. <laughs> Uh, and, and I want to go back to Bonnie's um, question about um, taking, you know, why, sh I mean, should we, should they continue to separate out these, uh, like, four levels of schooling, uh, and why have those as the four levels and so on? And um, are there things that, such as inspire, you know, I, the terminology is is odd, but the inspiring um, um, continued self education and developing communities of education and things like that in your in your life at every at every level. Uh, I mean, there's some value in it at every level and some way of doing it at every level. I think even mm -hmm. the primary and 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 so forth. So. Oh, would would you suggest a another level before primary, so a fifth level or or? You... Well, so uh, you know, as I put in the the chat here, um, I'm I'm worried that first of all that the level and ordering of things tends to be a very Western uh, notion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so um, I, I am concerned about that. Um, I suppose if you if you really love those levels and you cannot let them go, um, certainly being more inclusive of, across the levels of these some of these ideas, um, as Bill is saying. But also, yeah, absolutely. I mean, to to assume that nothing is learned prior to the the primary level of education um, is, I think, grossly misunderstands or misinterprets what it's like to have young children um, in your life and you know particularly with questions of relationships to um to to the earth and to nature um I, I feel like nobody really does that better than really young people sometimes um and right like <laughs> uh or at least in the i i guess in in my understanding of of educational structures here um, in the United States, right? That's not to say that in other places that's not flipped. Um, but I, I would say that I think it's significant to think about how uh, these structures, A, leave out certain things, but but also leaving out those pre-primary ages where plenty of education um, goes on. But also, you know, part of the, the question here in the United States has become um, uh, childcare, right? <laughs> and how childcare is, is or is not provided. Um, so I think that that becomes a question. If childcare is provided, uh, then, and provided meaning like really broadly provided, then I do have questions about what that, what that looks like and, and are we thinking about all the things that are learned during those ages and stages? I think one of the things that goes, that perhaps goes along with that is, um, to, to try to figure out ways to make the assertions while also letting the reader know that they're problematic assertions, you know? So is there a way to do that? Well, I, I think we've, we've done this in the whole session and, and this is what I've wanted to get out of this session for, for the whole group, not our group, but the, the, the international group to hear um, uh, feedback about the assumptions that are being made in the document. And I think that it's very helpful and will be very helpful for, yes. for the international group to hear what you have to say. So just to piggyback on what everyone was saying, I, I put it in the chat, but the assumptions about, um, yeah, I have to go in a second anyway, about mastery learning mm -hmm. um, and the levels that we go, right? Like, so there's an assumption that you get to something and then you level up. Um, and these are all linear and sequential sets of understanding. Like you do this level and then you do this thing and you have this understanding, then you go next. Um, and so while it's trying to make change, it's also busy, excuse me, my cat's busy messing with all my electronic gear. Um, uh, oh, great, Nicholas. Um, uh, it, it also does things for people who uh, think critically and creatively, but not linearly and sequentially, right? Um, there's a reason Thomas Edison and all these other people we like to venerate, even the sort of white 
uh, Pantheon got left school early. Um, you know, and so those are things to think about. And then the other thing in terms of the things that uh, Nick was saying before he left about whose research and whose voice are heard and to what we should listen to. Um, those are also not insignificant questions. Um, and uh, the, the irony to me in some of this document, um, and this will come no surprise as anyone who's heard me or Rob talk recently, is that curriculum studies, even with some of its tools being overly white and overly European, provides very basic tools for interrupting these things with very clear questions for a very long time. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm thinking a lot even of Klebart's question uh, and Klebart's critique of Tyler, like what's there at the end, except for your uh, positionality and your ethics that you have hidden behind this other set of understandings. Um, and so these are the kinds of things I think that would be helpful to, to have everyone else think about. Um, and also to, I think it's important that we who are in the global north and in North America specifically say that the kinds of things that have been taken up as the way to speak about education, the way to think about it, and the way to conceptualize it are deeply and utterly problematic and are brought about by a very narrow bandwidth of people with very strong material monetary interests to exploit as many people as they can. So education is not about education, but about monetary gain, not just in higher ed. And I think if we can emphasize this from our group coming forward and sort of encapsulate things that way, that might be helpful as well, because that's one of the things we see when we do quote unquote international education or consulting is that people have adopted the language of the publishing companies in the United States as the appropriate educational language to be heard. And I watch critical educators do it all the time. And it's a, it's a dangerous slippage. And I just wanted to say that um, before we all split. All right, yeah, and um, I'm going to, um... I'm going to stop recording now and um